looking around. So this is our first time uh, on the Oars Island. So thanks for coming. Uh, these panels have been a collaboration between the Harpsville Anchor, the Holbrooks Foundation, Huntings Harbor Library, the Harpsville Heritage Land Trust, and the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. There are working waterfront panel series where we're taking on different topics that pertain to the waterfront. Uh, we've done fishing through the seasons. We've done uh, generations of fishing families. And then tonight we are, of course, talking about access. Um, I'll let our panel introduce themselves, but a couple of quick housekeeping things. One, if you're on Zoom, please feel free to put your question in the chat um, and we'll try to answer as many as we possibly can. Uh, we have a couple of reports on the table next to Julia and Susan, including the State of Maine Fork and Waterfront Report and the Beyond the Bow Report. This one especially, this one's actually all about harp soil that Maine Coast Fishermen's Association did four, five years ago. Uh, and this, the State of Maine Working Waterfront Report was just a few years ago. Uh, there's also stickers, so. <laughs> So quickly, like I said, I'm Monique. Um, I actually live here on Orris Island. I'm a fishing family. Um, so I'm really excited that we've been able to do these panel series here, obviously, because um, I like my job, but also I adore the community that we get to work in. So I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves. Uh, so start with you, Ben. Who are you? Sure. I'm Ben Martens. I'm the executive director of the Maine Coast Fishermen Association, and I've been working in fisheries policy and uh, fishery community engagement for about 15 years now, both on Cape Cod and for the past 11 years up here in Maine. Okay, I'm Robert Boyce, Jr., and I've, I live on Orange Island, I'm the fifth generation hospital native, and I've had my claiming license for 31 years. Um, I've had a lobster license since I'm seven years old. I scooped over sea urchins for 12 years. <laughs> so I'm um, kind of a jack of a fisherman, jack of all trades, I guess. <laughs> and that's the way. And I'm on the Marine Resources Committee for like the last year. And thank you. Okay, I, I, you're a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mary Nate, and I'm here tonight representing. Paul Plummer, actually, uh, for the Marine Resources Committee. Uh, and I've lived um, on Bailey Island and I moved here about 22 years ago. And I'm um, excited tonight to just talk about access and how, it, how we need to start thinking about it. Thank you, Graham. Um, so we're kind of informal. If you have, I have a few questions for the panelists that we're going to get started with. But if you have questions that come up or want clarity around some terminology or something, please just feel free to ask. So I think um, the most important question to kind of kick things off with, one of the things that we talk about quite a bit in the State of Maine's Working Waterfront Report is exactly uh, what does access mean? So why don't we start there? Ben, what does access mean for, for MCFA? Yeah, when we talk about access, we think about everything it takes to get from your home out to where the fish or the marine resources are. And so um, while there's the traditional way of thinking about access, which is just the working waterfront, the, the piers, the wharfs, um, the docks, uh, you know, when we talk about permits, we talk about um, the ocean itself, we talk about boats. There's a lot of different things that you need to secure if you want to talk about access to um, those natural resources for a fisherman and for fishing business. Well, access means a lot to me, obviously, because I'm a player bigger. So, um, yeah, parking, I think, is one. the biggest issue for me is parking here on the slope. Us clam diggers, we can park pretty much on the beaches and stuff because we do it at low and high tide. But for the general public, it's really hard because there's no parking for them at high tide. So that's the biggest issue in our so high tide parking. <laughs> And I, as I think about access, we're talking about it more and more. And we've been um, working with the um, Casco Bay Shellfish Working Group, who has started to put together a good uh, online uh, app that is going to be available. And it makes me realize how we're looking at that from the resources viewpoint, but how far reaching it can be to so many areas of the community. 
and uh, whether we're talking through the resources committee or, or we're looking at resiliency or whether it's through uh, land for us and some of the other organizations, I think this is something going forward that is just getting started and could be really, really positive. Um, one of the things too that I think might be good to get a little bit clarity on is that something you said about like access to permits. Like how is that getting harder <laughs> for fishermen? Because fisheries are managed and you know from municipal to state to federal. If a fisherman wants to you get a clamor and go lobstering and maybe start ground fish fishing. Is that something that's an, an issue? Yeah, definitely. And so um, I'll give you guys a, a quick history of fisheries policy. So probably when you were young, uh, it wasn't that long ago that you could just decide I want to be a fisherman and you could get a permit, you go out and catch whatever you could find. Um, you need a boat, you need a lot of hard work and uh, a little bit of knowledge and know-how goes a long way we were able to do that. Uh, over time, though, we have started to clamp down on how we would regulate our fisheries because we started to over-harvest them. And we needed to start using best available science. We need to have accountability as a part of the equation. So that meant that we started to limit the number of permits that were available. For almost every fishery uh, that we participate in in the state of Maine or in federal waters or even at the municipal level, uh, there's a limited number of permits that are now available. Some of those permits are non-transferable. So that means that you have to get on a list and you have to hope to get one through a lottery process or um, over time, as people go out of the fishery, you can get in eventually. Uh, for federal waters fisheries, where we tend to operate for the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association, those are things like brown fish, there's federal lobster, there's scallop, there's menhaden, um, there's herring. Uh, those, those permits are transferable. So, you can actually, there's a limited pool of them that exists in the world. And if a fisherman owns one, they can sell it on the other side. Uh, and those permits vary in um, value from a ground fish permit that is scaled to fit on a small boat with no catch history associated with that. That might go for fifteen dollars to $20,000. Um, and if you want to buy a big boat scallop permit, that could cost you $7 million. So if you want to really start to grow and invest a business, uh, it takes serious money to start to diversify. Um, and right now in uh, the Gulf of Maine, one of the, the newer fisheries that's been emerging out there is the scallop fishery, the Northern Gulf of Maine scallop fishery. It's been a, a great success story as we're seeing scallops rebound in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, the permits that you need to go catch those scallops, six years ago, those were going for $30,000. And this past year, they were going for $130,000. And that's because there's value, but there's also a limited pool. So those are the types of things when we talk about permit access, is if you are a young fisherman, if you want to be building a business, you not only need to be able to access those permits, sometimes you need to be able to access quota, that's pounds of fish to catch. It's very complicated. So um, permits are a hard part of the equation when you start thinking about how to build a fishing business. So, uh, I have a question. So, those permits that you're talking about, those drag scallops? They are. Yeah. So, in federal waters, those are drag caught scallops. Um, state waters, we do have a diver caught fishery um, and a drag yeah, caught permission. fishery. Yeah, permit also. Yeah. So, in state waters, just because nothing is simple in fisheries, in state waters, we have limited number of permits for both diving and for dragging. Um, those are non transferable. So, state waters permits are non-transferable. So if you want uh, to get a state water scallop permit, you have to enter a lottery. Usually every year there's one, two, or three of those available, and you have to hope to get one of those. Otherwise, you can, if you had one previously, you can keep holding on to that. But it, it, so that's where it's hard to become, um, to diversify your business. Then what would you pay for a dive scallop permit? So you can't buy them. So those okay, dives, just once you get in the lottery, then it's just yours. And then it's yours. Yeah, you have to every year you have to renew it with the state for a couple hundred dollars. Um, but um, yeah, there's no so it's just lottery. Yeah, yeah. so the, it's a federal a federal permit. So that's the same issue where when you hear about lobster or state waters lobster permits, mm -hmm. there's a, a list that you have to get on within your zone to try and get one of those. Whereas if you are a New Hampshire fisherman, if you want to go catch um, catch lobsters, you can just buy a federal permit and then land those lobsters in the 
issues. So there is there's equity issues, there's there's issues from different states, different areas that all kind of coalesce. And if you are trying to be a fisherman in state waters, federal waters, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, there's all kinds of rules, regulations on your permits, your boats, and landings that all come together. Uh, I understand that there is an effort to uh, reduce the number of permits, at least for ground fishing. There are groups that buy them and require them to sit on them and don't fish. Is that accurate? Yeah, so we do that. Um, but we don't do that to retire them, right? So in the ground fish fisheries, those are things like cod, paddock, flounders, uh, that fishery has gone to a quota-based system. So that means that every permit has a catch history attached to it, and there's uh, a certain number of pounds that are allocated to each one of those permits moving forward through time. Uh, there are about 2,000 ground fish permits in New England, and there's not enough fish for all those permits to be caught. So what we've done is we partner with the Nature Conservancy. We go out and raise money and buy permits. So we are buying that quota. We are bringing it to Maine and keeping it to Maine forever. And then we are leasing it at affordable lease rates to local fishermen so that they can then get access to those fish. So it's a permit bank. It's a way of building trust so that a fisherman who might not be able to afford a big ground fish permit can buy a smaller one, but still get access to the pounds of fish that they have. Once you own that permit, you're legally allowed to hang onto a bank and then you describe that in perpetuity before the law changes. Yeah, until the law changes. So uh, owning a fishing permit is a privilege, not a right. And so at any point in time, rules or regulations can change. And as you can tell, commercial fishing and like what Ben's talking about is incredibly complicated. It's funny, my husband's, well, it's not funny. My husband's been fishing for 30 plus years and I've been working in the commercial fishing industry for almost 20 years at Main Coast Fishermen's Association. When it comes time to renew permits or buy new permits or figure out what thing to fill out, sometimes even my husband and I get confused and we have to call on MCFA or someone at the MLA and, and try to figure things out to make sure that we're doing things correctly. And I've actually never really thought of that as a form of access, but I guess information or access to the information necessary to be able to get the appropriate permits and know what you need and what type of catch history you need, that's also a, a type of access. So Robert, I, for you, uh, parking I absolutely uh, is um, an obstacle for you in your day with clamming. But what about things like um, maintenance, if you needed to put a boat on the beach, um, storage for gear and being able to do things, are those difficult too, or are they getting harder? I don't know. Um, well, lucky, this town does have a lot of shore access and a lot of people don't know about that you learn about. Them. <laughs> So, like, no, we, even, I mean, I had to beg. My lobster boat's over at Beth Point Boatyard, which is my payday. Get over there. Actually, my little boat is over there right now. I beg. And there's somebody died. The people, the people that have to be there, they're like, oh, we're going to have to be there. They're going to have to be there. They have like a couple parking places. So, it's like three parking places for this. So, but thank God that the people at Beth Point Boatyard like charge $6 to park there. So that took me to over there and but I look out and that bay way over on the other side, that's way of parking over there. And then in this bay, there's like three bays of our slow. We park on the beach, and the guy will get off the hill of the road or cooks, we can park on the beach. So parking's like very limited. But especially for people like kayakers or boaters that are out longer than my time. But yeah, um, not to confuse like what he said, uh, federal permits is the ones that you can buy and sell. State permits, you can't buy and sell. Is the way that works. Like my lobster, I have a state lobster license. I only can go, they say three, it's a three mile line. It's three miles from like the nearest land. So it's more like seven miles from the coast. And then once you get that, if I want to go offshore here, I would have to buy a license. Like 10 years ago, you could buy it for like $10,000, and now it's like you can find it for like $25,000. But if you wanted to be in the because there's three big zones or more, so if I wanted to get the zone where Georgia's bag is and Cassius Land is, those sell for like over $100,000. And like big companies like New Hampshire, this company called Shaftmasters, they have like 12 offshore lobster, 100 foot boats that go. 
as soon as they see our optional permit for sale, they buy it. So you don't give a chance for anybody else to get it. So they're very difficult to get, even if you have the money. So, the cost of doing business is definitely a piece of that. But this year, there was like, I think there's quite a few. There's like nine dragger scholar licenses available in the state and like five dive. I put in for all of them, but a lot of people put in for them, so you can't just get them very slim. Just like the EO license, a lot of people put in for those. What do you mean by put in for them? You'll see on the Department of Resources website where the licenses are available with the lottery, and then you pay like so much money for so many chances. And if you get one, then you get one, and then they'll tell you one or whatever. Small though, how many licenses? There were, how many, do you remember how many it was for the EO licenses? There wasn't a lot available, and over 300 people, I think, put in very slim chance. But as far as long term goes, it's very easy for a kid, a high school, like a great kid in school, to get a lobster license. As long as he does his time when he comes an adult, he can like go on to be a lobster. But if you take an adult that tries to get a lobster license and they're so they have to put their two years of their time, and then they have to get on a wait list maybe for 10 years right now. In this zone, you get a lobster license, so it's very difficult for an adult. Not so difficult for a kid or a teen. But the kid, as I understand it, they can't take a break uh, to go to college or to be in the military or something. They must continue to lobster from the time they're in practice through adulthood and stay in or they lose their license. They have until they're 18 years old to do a thousand hours, but if they go to school or something like that, they can continue their thousand hours after that. You can keep your license as long as even if you don't fish, you can take a couple of years off as long as you keep buying it. Yeah, as it true. stands now. Yeah. I mean, they keep talking about making people fish, use them or lose them, but they have no idea. Marion, what kind of uh, access things are you talking about in the Marine Resources Committee right now? Is that coming up a lot? Well, one of the things that Robert mentioned was parking and, um, and, and, uh, and also just access to the flats that they've been fishing for a while because um, over in um, Cundis Harbor area, people out there last year, you know, People who are here for a long time and they allow the access, and then they either move away or they sell the property, and new people coming in know nothing about it, and we'll, we'll shut the access off. So um, I think we're seeing it happen more frequently because it's an aging community and property is turning over, and there isn't a really good understanding about the historic pathways uh, that have been available for, for generations to use. And um, I feel it's something that if people knew about more about, they might be more open to it. Uh, it's not knowing about it, you know, having something walk through your brand new, <laughs> your driveway, your brand new house, you're a little put off. So uh, I think that's an area where uh, that is always part of game. Uh, are the two areas that you know we, we need to think more about. Do you have any, um, not necessarily personally, or but your the Marine Resources Committee or Paul Plummer, have they been talking about some solutions for like historical right of ways or what we could be doing to work with the community? I think we just started talking about it two meetings ago with with the with the working group because they asked us to work with them in uh, designating areas, or not areas, but um, actually access points. And the question comes up then is how public is it? And how, uh, how is it going? So we had a meeting where we spent a lot of time just going through the access points. The, the diggers have a really good sense of where they are and the, the conditions around them. And um, so we're gonna see how that goes. But I also know that the town itself is looking at parking and uh, the town administrator sent out an email to all committees to think about parking issues in town. I think it came up at the town lands meeting. So there is uh, there's something we, to talk about. If these pathways are blocked, then it forces the, the climbers to access the climb paths by boat or whatever. 
which takes a lot more time, and that can be reflected to the people on the shore as well. That's right, Ed, because that's something that harvesters always said we don't want to use air boats in town, but if we don't have the access, uh, you're kind of forced to do it. Mary Ann, we had a question in um, from someone on Zoom about identification of waterfront access points in Harpswell that are public and whether there is a place to see where those locations are. It's an interesting question. I know we have some places marked as part of the, the trail guide and the hiking guide. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that we have places marked specifically for uh, Fishing, uh, of course, there's the kayak entrance that are, are part of that. But that's a really good question. It's something that we, we do have a list of public access. You have to go to town office to get it. We yeah. do have a list. Mm -hmm. But we're making a map. She's making a map. <laughs> yes, she is. Yeah, they're going to make a map for us. Thank we're trying to walk them all. Yeah. And you had it, you might. Jill, you had your hand up. I had the exact same question. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I was interested in the discussion of access, and then there was a little sidebar on, well, don't say where you get in. <laughs> um, yeah. My dilemma as a real estate agent in Harpswell, living in Harpswell, working in Harpswell, is how can I prepare buyers coming in for the fact this is a fishing town. I'm not allowed to strangle them. I'm not allowed to hang them up by their phones. All I can do is drive them around the town and say, there's a stack of lobster pots there and quills of line. If you don't want to look at that, Harpswell may not be the right place for you. Now that sounds terrible. But I love Harpswell. <laughs> <laughs> when I first moved here, I was thrilled every time I came around the corner. There was a boat. It wasn't anywhere near water. So you'd have to get closer. It was up on, what do you call it? A skip. A stand. No, a skip. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, that just thrilled me. So, and this is this is terrible. I won't let a buyer come into Harpswell without telling them they have to drive around Harpswell with me. But I'm going to introduce. I, I'd say I'm going to introduce you to the neck and the characteristics of the neck, the islands, the characteristics of the islands, and Cundy's Harbor. But during that, we talk about dirt roads. And yes, we have them. And yes, if you're going to get from here to there, you have to be on one. We talk about the lobster traps in the north. We talk about all sorts of things having to do with this is a fishing town. And then there are some people say, yeah, I need to go someplace else. This is not this is not the close part that I expected it to be. But a lot of people say, well, that's why I'm coming here. The access from private property. I'm sure a lot of us agents would be very helpful in this matter if we knew where they needed to be or who was using a, a but it's tricky because if you're using a private property that perhaps the path is in the woods or something. Yeah. yeah, it is a fine line. Um, I, I know I'm already, but I, I'll I'll say um, one. I know as a fishing family, I appreciate. I think education and outreach and panels like this. This is exactly why we're doing this. Is just to be able to chat with people and say, you know, <laughs> this is a fishing community. And the fishing families will answer questions. You know, how do we talk about fishing and traps in the shore yard and seasonality and things like that. A uh, number of years ago, Maine Sea Grant um, produced a guide for the Moosebeck region and Harpswell called Welcome to a Waterfront Community or something. It's still available at the town hall. And actually, it's also one of our efforts at this panel. When our organizations are going to be working together to sort of figure that out, how do we update it to 
not just educate or you know share rules or anything about being an efficient community, but help celebrate efficient community because these are food harvesters that are bringing. I don't think anybody complains about you know lobster or scallops or clams. You know that's. This is how we get it is by accessing the water and sometimes rope stinks and, you know, sometimes there's traps everywhere. So it's, um, I think the people that are like coming to Hartsall and they're like, that's, that's what I'm looking for. That's awesome. But I think maybe that isn't for everybody. Um, but it is just a means of like producing information and communicating with people and opening up opportunities to be able to ask questions. But then there's that side about right of ways being that fine line between is it just passed down from generation to generation or is it something that's open to everybody? Right. And I need to uh, I need to tell you, I need to talk to Hermie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's inviting me. Okay. So just to answer answer a specific question that you started yes. with is um, so while there might be sensitivity around some of these private right of ways that are being used, um, at a time like right now where we have significant turnover of properties, there are tools that can be used to protect right of ways through sales of easements, right? And that yes. might be a place that Harpsville Heritage Land Trust um, might be able to do work. I know that the uh, Heritage Land Trust has done that work in Downey Spain significantly, but if that's a place where if it starts to be something that a, um, a real estate agent or a uh, harvester is seeing like oh, this property might be turning over. Is it time to have a conversation with the current landowners about how we put an easement on this right of way? Um, there are some things that you can start to do so that no matter who buys that place, you've tied their hands, right? And and that as a community can be a conversation to be had as well as we start having um, changes take place. Um, and then, then if I could just um, add a little bit to that, that's one of the uh, things. Main Coast Heritage Trust was at a you know, meeting I was at the beginning of the week who brought this up and saying that actually there's various types of rights of way. And um, some of the, the reasons people are hesitant about giving the right of way or an easement uh, for someone off the road is liability. But Maine's laws are such that uh, you don't carry the same type of liability that you might in another state. And as I said, you can you can grant it right away and you can always take it away. Uh, and that's uh, by agreement. And there's various types. I was very interested to hear that there's various types. And uh, they can be temporary, they can be for a fixed term at a time. Uh, and you as a property owner have the ability to reset it when you want to. There are also licenses for particular use. Well, in the Red Sox hat. Yeah, but. yeah, I've been on a unique situation for Zom. I moved into town five years ago, and uh, traditionally, I think there wasn't access lane uh, to where I live. And uh, you know, I'm aware of what's going on, and uh, I'm in favor. You know, I'm a tradesman. I think anybody who anybody has a right to do what they know how to do, uh, do the family. So. Um, but my hands are kind of tied because uh, uh, there's been several incidents. There's been uh, attempted break ins, there's been uh, people skiing down the road, there's been, uh, man, somebody dropped like a half dozen TVs uh, at the end of the road one time, just dumped two TVs off the back of the truck. Things like that that I'm not saying that they were planners, um, but you know, the traffic that we see up and down the road. Is kind of trust where they come. So, you know, I think that the people that, that are in my neighborhood sort of prefer to just shut it down entirely to just avoid any kind of trouble. Um, and I would love for somebody to make an argument where, where I would feel, you know, uh, involved enough to go to my neighbor's and lobby to say, look, I think you've got it wrong, you know. Um, but I, I, like, I wonder if there, you can only call the police after something's happened. And, you know, it's not really like a of protection, right? So, um, is there some governing body or a union or a, uh, I know that there's an MCFA uh, where the climbers sort of all can self police and kind of get the word out if something happens and say, hey, if we want to keep access to this place, we got to keep this clean. 
in, in, in the past, claim diggers have had a real bad day. I get that. But it's not that easy to have a keep a claim and license. We have to do we have to do conservation work three days a year, and we pick up like I don't know how many thousands of pounds of garbage off the shore at Rumsville every year. And we've had some bad people that were in the claiming business, but most of them have died of overdoses or went to jail and lost their license. So I would say that almost every digger that I know that is good. But our biggest issue is, is we have more diggers that can dig anywhere in the state and they come to the and they dig and they leave their garbage and stuff and it gives us a bad name. Like down on Dowdy's Point Road, there's an incident where people were building their house and some more diggers dropped by. They said, well, why didn't you give us access? I mean, why didn't you ask permission to walk through here? And they didn't. And then when they showed up, there was a lot of windshields that it was done by worm makers. And years ago, up on the way to Chatterjee, our world selected lives, someone sold it on board. I think that was a clam digger that is no longer alive. But then things do happen, and we try to do everything we can to stop that. I think majority of your diggers, are, we go out of our way to pick up garbage. I think the biggest problem with us now is our language. <laughs> it's true. That's what we got to work on. But as far as, but as far as being, I think that there's so many people that say that they're intimidated by us, and then when they meet us, they're like, oh my God, you guys are so different than I ever believed. Like Almost say, every digger that I met, we give, we give, I don't know how many clamps to people or offer clamps to everybody we see for free or co hogs on a daily basis. So, and I think even though we sell like 60 licenses, there's only like 20 of us that dig on a full time basis. And I think all the 20 guys that do that, we go above and beyond. <clears throat> so I kind of stick up for them, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and, and it's horrible. I, I hate that these things happen. And I hate that going to get complaint for it. And it happens all the time. I mean, if I see trash on the shore, I go out of my way to pick it up. And I think most of our stickers would do that. For the record, every time I've been out in that, there's been a super decent person. I mean, in fact, one of the reasons brought me out last to me how to dig, which is really cool. And I'm a residential life, you know, so that's really helpful. Um, and I would like to help out, I just don't know quite how to stick my neck out, you know, for people that I don't know, you know, because then it'll, if, if any, if the next thing that happens, it's going to be, you know, on me. So I'm trying to figure out how to go about changing attitudes, you know, really. I've lived in this town my whole life, I get it. I mean, I've been down these dirt roads, we see the teams, we see the tires, we see all that stuff too, so I totally understand. Yeah, I would just encourage that that might be yeah. a, it might be a starting spot with the um, the harvesting group that is in town that is you know they're the ones that go through rules regulations talk about what the status of the stock and, and where we're going to be fishing all those things they monitor closures um, and so it the best path forward for you would probably be how do I go and work with the town to set up a process for potentially creating an access point there that could be um, you know, and as parents, it's like open it, shut it, right? Give it a try and, and start small. And, and it doesn't have to be a, a free for all. But I, I, I love your approach and thought process. Um, but I think bringing in some other people to start to facilitate some of those conversations and think about the opportunities is, um, you know, bluntly, what we usually find is the best way to stop conflict is by forcing people to talk to each other. And so, of course, we will talk to each other early in those kind of situations. We always been an issue of transition of property ownership where there's an access. I spent decades working with Maine Island Trail Association on that very subject. And about 25 years ago, we recognized the people that own the islands that they put on the trail, they're going to die. And their heirs are living in California or someplace. What are they going to do with that island? They're going to sell it. What's somebody else going to do? They're going to build a house on the thing, And it's going to go away. So we started to help our owners transition the islands into land trusts with conservation easements on them. 
And a couple of hundred hours later, there's now 300 hours of holy street for public access. When I think about this neighborhood he's talking about, it reminds me of something we probably all read about, Cedar Beach. <laughs> we happened to post that nonprofit, that Parkville Community Foundation. And that was a war going on right through an appeal process. When it was all done, the owner of the property went to the town hall and said, well, now that the lawsuit's over, it's clear that I'm in control of my property, how do we arrange for the use of the beach? She was never against the use of the beach. She was against trashing her yard. She was against a one road, it was a one lane road. She couldn't get to her own house because it was full of Hertz cars from the hotels. And the town worked out a process for the trash to be disposed of. Somebody was a place to park the cars in them. She was never against the use of the beach. She was concerned about the stuff your neighbors on. And she didn't start the lawsuit. She bought the property and had the lawsuit in process for it. So I, I finally asked the guy that was running that parade, have you talked to Betsy? No. They're in an appeals court and they've never actually talked to the landowner to, to try to work out a deal. So they spent years of litigation instead. So I think if we focus on an access question and we look to the realtor's point, where are those points of access? Just like we do with the islands, we catalog them all and we waited for the opportunity to make the move. So when it happened, we knew it. And, and then we could act on it. We'd already acted with the owners go ahead of time, helping them think about what they wanted for their property. And many of them wanted to leave it open for access for generations to come. Great points. But you have to do it. You can't. Otherwise, she'll sell it and they'll walk. <laughs> Heather, you got um, I, just, I just wanted to let you know that my mom, who is now 97, she has always given access for planning. Always. Um, I won't tell you what she did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but here's how it was handled. First of all, she had a relationship with the client. And what was interesting is when um, a clamor was bringing a new person, he came to the house, he talked to my mom. The first couple of times he took, he came with him. So my mom and dad felt really comfortable with that. And yes, we always got a pack of clams or whatever. And my mother would leave things for the clams. So she has this personal relationship. But I can tell you there were times when, um, after my dad died, she was really looked forward to the day that the clam came because he would come, see if she was okay. So there's this relationship. But the important thing was when the clamor handed it off, he made that personal talk. And she went down and would watch them do it. And then they would check with her. And this is still going on, but it's good to know about the easement because my mother is very concerned that there will always be that reason for, as she said, those diggers of mine. She talks about their mind. We've got a couple of girls now and she talks about, you know, yeah. relationships are very important with that. That communication, that talking, you know, and taking that responsibility. Of, this is my land, but this is your path. And we have this wonderful relationship. She also has a duck line that she allows certain people to use because she can't get rid of them. And she's got it. And that's another thing where it's candid and she leads the people and all of that. Thank you, Heather. We have a question back there. So, Donna mentioned um, cataloging periods on the island. Are there, is there somebody also collecting this information about all the different codes for people? Like, is that an active um, effort right now? Yep. So the question for everybody on Zoom is, is someone um, collecting information about the codes as well? So Marianne, you said yes. That yeah, it was pretty much, I think, not as I recall, because we have so many of them in our so many and so many areas where we do plan things. It would include the codes. Okay. Probably mostly codes as I think about it. Yeah. yeah. The second part of my question is um, how much are closures of land plants kept 
Yeah. Excellent question. So uh, it was uh, how much are closures affecting the plant flats today? So Robert, do you want to take that one? I don't know. <laughs> we 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 get some closures, but we work on them to get the water back. It's a process, so I don't. We have a lot of places that our water come back bad in the winter time. I mean, good in the winter time, but bad in the summer time, obviously, because of the heat and the people that live there. So we have a lot of colds, and then we try to find that pollution and try to. We get grants if it's a mixture of system that's running in and that fix it. And, 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 as far as access goes, we're good. <laughs> it's a working. I mean, they're addressing the I, I think it is. Uh, in fact, what we do have is we have a number of closed. The process of opening a flat once DMR closes it is quite involved and it takes a number of testing of the water over a period of uh, years almost. It's easy to close hard to reopen. So we have a number of flats in the area, in town, that have been closed for a long time that we feel are should be opened at this point. The problem is the state doesn't have staff enough to do the, the amount of testing it would take. So uh, we're fortunate we were able to get a grant that we're working on now for the Broadreach, I think it's for Broadreach Fund, uh, and that uh, we hire a consultant to test uh, Spruce Cove, which has been closed for a long while, uh, and also the northern edge of uh, Round Out, Downey mm -hmm. Point, and over in the Compass Harbor uh, to see. Uh, if you can't open the whole flat, you can narrow down the area that is causing the pollution. And we, we learned some new things that, um, while it's not part of the normal testing, uh, they can test now for DNA. It's a second test, which is a little more expensive, but that can tell you whether or not it's the fecal matter is from human or and almost what animal. So uh, not that you would use that everywhere, but there's been selected places that can be helpful. Yeah. Just, to, just to chew on that red meat for a minute of what you're at, like make sure your septic system is working correctly, right? Yeah. Like that is, that's a big one. And like, you know, back to your dog, don't use fertilizer. Like there's a bunch of those things that you live on or close to the, the ocean. Um, all those, everything in Harpool is running into the ocean, right? You put it on your lawn, it's going in the ocean. If you're putting it down the drain, it's going in the ocean. So um, being really smart about that is, like that's a very easy stuff that everybody can do. Don't be afraid to tell us either. If your subject is a bad, you can't afford it. We can get grants to fix it if it's affecting our claim funds. But so, so it isn't like it's going to cost you. Is there an effort to identify non-performing or poorly performing septic systems? You, you can put dye tablets in your septic system and see if your septic system is running. That'd be hard to ask a landowner to do, but. Well, if there's just, pollution coming in one of our codes and we can't figure it out, we could actually ask you to volunteer to put a dye thing in the sewer and we'll see if your sewer is running like a color or something comes out and we can people, figure it out that way. Most people that live on the water, if they were notified that there's a problem, I can't believe that sit there and say, well, I don't care if I'm doing anything about it. Uh, particularly if there was a grant money available. It just makes sense that the town would try to identify it. I believe that we. The codes office, I'm not sure if it's codes or the harbor master, if there's a suspicion of a faulty septic system, they can run the die and then talk to the landowner about the financing, how they can finance to get it fixed. I think that um, Canadian geese is one of our biggest issues. Uh, yeah. Because anywhere there's fresh water, there's Canadian geese, so it's hard to tell if it's coming from the septic system or Canadian geese. Okay. So that's kind of the issue. So that's where the DNA is. Yeah, <laughs> because a lot of our places is where the fresh water pours in. I think a lot of it has to do with the to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. we so I don't of, know. <laughs> I, we know, had like, a lot of overboard discharge through yeah. licenses years ago, but Harpswell has pretty much taken care of all that can be. I think the two areas left are probably Cox Point and the lower end of Bailey Island. And uh, so most of the most of the overboards have been changed over now 
So um, that that feature uh, is really helpful, especially for Coral Hong Bay, which has the circulation problem. Well, it's very important to clear the use for tea. I mean, the last thing we want to do is get somebody sick of our clients. You know what I mean? That kind of horrible. So it's important that we have. I mean, I have no problem with cold down or something. It's not good, obviously. Robert, I know there's the, the opportunity to purge a uh, shellfish before they're sold. Yeah. There used to be an operation down the uh, Kittery Portsmouth area with somebody down east. Of the Is that something that would be productive uh, to have another purging operation closer to home where you could? Set the, the shellfish aside. I don't know. You know, it's funny. My dad used to tell me that was going to happen someday. That you dig clams and take them to a place to get them washed out for a couple of days. Yeah. But what you're talking about is there's a couple companies in Maine that do depuration digging, we call it, which I've done before. There's not really, we didn't dig really enough. Oh, yeah, we did. We did, we did stone scope. We dug stone scope during that. And what we did is Moody shellfish, and they you go to they bring in like 20 guys, and then whoever lives in the town is diggers allowed to dig. Like if they do it in Hobson Hall, Hobson diggers are invited. And we all went over there and dug, and then they go and they put them in their lights and flush them with water for like two days, and then they resell them. But I don't know, maybe it will come to that. I mean, maybe someday all the coals will be closed, and then the Hobson diggers will. Have to take your clams to a washing station and have the buyers buy it there. I mean, that is a possibility. One of the things we were looking at was using the discharge from a land based aquaculture system where you're discharging clean water and you can use that water stream as a way to purge yeah. the shellfish in the area. They do them under lights, they run water through them in the room and push up the lights. Yeah. Moody Shellfish has a, one of the places in Kennedy Harbor. Yeah. Susan, was there a question on Zoom? Yeah, there's a question um, from a participant on Zoom about incentives for uh, maintaining easements or um, access points and whether there have been identification of possible incentives for property owners. And I know, Marianne, not to steal your answer a little bit, but I know that the working group has been um, coming up with some of those possibilities for for property owners. I don't know if you want to speak to that. I don't know that I can speak in any detail because I'm not sure how far that's progressed. But what I did glean the other night is as we get into this, more and more things are going to come to the surface. Something like an incentive that is brought up is something that's probably could be thought about more. I'm not sure that what other than the incentive we have now is where the, the actual harvester, you know, gives gives the uh, the landowner uh, a little uh, at a, dinner. <laughs> at, at our last clip, I mean, at the last green resource community meeting, we talked about having a Harvest Well resident appreciation day from the figures. We talked about that. I think they're going to try to rent this hall. They are. In this summer, we're going to have, we're going to, all the diggers are going to vote on story clams, and we're going to invite the people from Hunts all year to eat them for free. And so that's kind of one of the your answers. That's awesome. So Jessica Joyce, who is from the Regional Shellfish Working Group, just chimed in that there are some tax incentives at the state level. Um, I don't have the specifics of those to share, but I can, after this, send the link to the Working Group's report, which I think details those. Thank you. Yeah, Robert, did I hear you say that anybody that had a plan like this, the state could dig in our form? No, anybody who has a state worm license can dig. Worm worm. And if you have a worm license, they dig these worms, and you can dig anywhere in the state. There's no closed areas for it. But the planners have to stay within the county yeah. issue? Yeah, we have to stay in our okay. Thank you. So we have all these wormers that come here. And they like leave their trash and stuff. We can play for it. It's not really fair. <laughs> I, mean, we... I have a follow up question to that. Maybe you know there was legislation that, or excuse me, there was new ordinance and was it Harpswell specifically that said now if you've been a Harpswell claimer in the past but have had to move out of town because of costs and other issues that you could still 
with proof of residency in the past. Is that did that is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. That's that's yeah. That's totally yeah. And that's something that up and down the coast we're seeing towns having to do is create exemptions from their citizens licensing programs because folks can't afford to stay in those communities. Um, and so that's that's as we are transitioning um, along, especially the mid coast of Maine, um, where a lot of fishermen uh, or harvesters, and whether it's access to permits through the town office um, or it's the working waterfronts that you need to be a fishing business, like the docks and the piers. Um, you know that's that's really hard. That becomes a, a really significant barrier as you start having to um, not only not be able to potentially access the permits that you need because you can't afford to live in a um, coastal community, but if you are now a fisherman who is a lobsterman or a groundfish fisherman and you need access to a working wharf or a co-op. Um, most working waterfront decisions are made at the municipal level. And so now you're removing the people from the voting population um, who might need to raise their hand to talk about um, the needs for access within a community. So Harpswell is actually really unique because it's a bit of a hub for a lot of other communities around it. Um, so you know, Brunswick, Bowdoin, Bowdoinham, even Freeport, um, you know, Durham, there are fishermen who and crew members who live in all those areas who rely on access points in Harpswell. Um, and you know, their voice, the fisherman's voice used to be really prominent in town decision making. And um, we started to see a migration out, um, unfortunately. And so that's just one of those other pieces that as you're talking about access, who controls access, um, voting is important. Decisions, ordinances, easements, all those things that a town might control. And Harpswell is really progressive and great and puts the fishing community um, front and center in a lot of their decisions. But you can imagine in other places a little bit further south down our coast, uh, that's starting to slip away. And we're really starting to hear that from, from some fishermen. You took what I was going to say access to voting. Yeah, it's like a good one. <laughs> okay, so. Can I do one other? Just, yes. Go right. ahead. Uh, the other thing is, so uh, you guys, I don't know, not everybody probably be able to, but we've got uh, monkfish stew um, yeah. over in the corner that it's we made as part of our, our food access program for Maine Coast Fishermen's Association Fishermen's Community Maintenance Program. But um, all of us can only get access to most seafoods because there are fishermen that are going out and catching it and harvesting it. And despite having so much coast and so much ocean in Maine, we actually don't consume a lot of seafood in our state. Um, it's pretty pretty sad when we start looking at the numbers for um, how much fish is consumed in Maine, and especially in newer generations, younger kids, schools. Um, and so this is one of those places that it's often hard to talk about fishing without immediately going to the economics of fishing. Um, but we forget that it's like it's a crucial part of our food system in Maine, uh, and it could be a bigger part of our food system. But if we lose access to that um, in the ground fish fishery, we still have a handful of boats in places like Harpswell and Portland that go fishing. But most of that access and permits and infrastructure and vessels has moved to places like Gloucester and Bedford and Boston, right? So we are losing access as a community to local seafood. Uh, and that right now, maybe you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, fine, not a big deal. But now it's food insecurity and food security for all of us is a bigger issue. You know, I had people when COVID hit, we didn't have any meat on the supermarket shelves for that like three week period or whatever that was, right? Like I had more phone calls from random people saying, hey, where can I find fish? I'd like to go buy fish for fish, right? Like food security matters in our world. And if we don't invest in the infrastructure, and the people um, to give us that access, that's that's an important part of the equation for all of us when we talk about um, what it means to be on the coast of Maine and thinking about our food and what we can eat. So access to seafood for the non-fishermen, if you will, mm -hmm. is important too. And the monkfish stew obviously makes that easier, but can yeah. we also look at the food insecurity side that you talked about too, with the fishermen feeding maintenance program maybe? Sure, I'm have to pitch that. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> One of the one of the things that we have, unfortunately, in our state is we have pretty high food insecurity. 
uh, in New England and Northeast New York and Eastern Central State. And in COVID, when a lot of our ground fish boats were going fishing, they couldn't get paid for their fish. The fish uh, traditionally would end up in restaurants. And so those restaurants were shut down. We had fishermen that were coming back with thousands of pounds of delicious seafood. And the best price they could get for it was turning it into bait. Uh, so we set up this program, we went out and raised money, and we said we want to buy that fish from fishermen at a fair market price. And then we want to donate it into this food secure system that um, was in desperate need for high quality protein. And that's what we've got in fish coming out of our oceans. So we started that program. We were incredibly um, uh, amazed at the support that we got from the community to make donations to help get that going, foundations. Um, but we want to keep it going. And so we've got this project uh, over here called Main Coast Monkfish Stew, where we take the monkfish. We're now turning monkfish, which is like, it's a harder fish for some people to access and understand and eat and cook. Um, so it's in this easily digestible, you know, easily cookable pouch that you can heat up in a, a hot plate. And, um, and it was so good, we decided that we wanted to start selling it besides just making donations with it. So uh, you can purchase it as well. Uh, and so that's a, a feedback back into the, the system. But we are actually, we are still keeping, like this was a program that was set up in a time of crisis for COVID, right? Um, it's had a lot of value for our fishermen to help stabilize market, but we can't keep up with the demand right now with the local food um, insecurity. So we are getting phone calls from soup kitchens throughout the state that are saying lines are longer right now to get access to food than what it was at the height of the COVID pandemic because of the cost of food. Um, and inflation. So, um, yeah, so like we, we, we are kind of exploring and playing in this area now because there's a very real need and an opportunity with what's out in our oceans. Um, so anyways, that's, that's part of the access program. Is, um, and one of the pieces of that is we are also not just donating in places like Good Shepherd or Mico Center Prevention. We're also opening up our doors and saying any any of the schools in Maine that want access to fish, you can have it um, because we want to be feeding kids seafood. And there's a selfish piece to that, right? Like it's a drug we want to get them hooked early so that they're eating seafood for the rest of their lives. But uh, it's also there's lots and lots of amazing data about how important it is to be eating seafood at the level. Um, and once again, that's one of those places that if you were just to go to school and say. What can you afford to buy on your school food budget? Like a chicken nuggets or a pizza that might have tomatoes, right? So certainly not cottage. Yeah, it's not, it's not you know, fish tacos and attic and clowns. And so um, so we're incredibly proud of that program, but it, it is also a bit of a it is a bit depressing though when you start talking about access to food um, and how a lot of the same issues that we talk about in the fishing community when it comes to equity and access and standing are also on the other side of the equation when it comes to who's actually consuming the food. And so we, you know, we need to be selling our seafood at a high price to support the local fishermen um, and the small seafood businesses, but we also need to be creating opportunities to make sure that we can um, feed those within our communities um, throughout that time. Have you had a lot of school districts take advantage of that? Or just yeah. a handful? No, we've had a lot. Of, uh, Susan, I don't know if you know the number of the top here. Mary, Mary, Mary Hudson, who runs that program, is, is not here, but we, um, yeah, we've had a ton of school districts. We actually have one. So this, one of uh, one of the other barriers that is currently out there for fishermen is finding good crew, right? Getting, uh, one of our fishermen who has been selling into the fishermen community program is like, I can't go. I can't. My crew guy's sick. I can't go. Uh, one of the one of the people who ran a food program in one of the local schools was like. I'll take a day off. And he went out fishing with them and he grew it up. Uh, and so we, we, schools love it. The kids love it. It's, it's been great. It's been, um, yeah, so I, I don't have a number for you, but it's, it's, yeah, it's been well received, been well received by the kids that those preparing to the fish. Yeah, I don't know district numbers, mm -hmm. but we have, there are over 50 groups throughout the state who are recipients, community groups, school districts, food banks um, for the Fisherman Food Bringers program. I think there's somewhere around 20 different school districts. We have the kids from 75 coming out as well. I think around the 20th or the 25th of this month. Mm -hmm. We're taking them across the street from the town office to teach them how to take plans, mm -hmm. show them the green crabs and different things, how to walk in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> 
but yeah, it's perfect. It's just really good. Yeah, the, the only other thing, like we we spent a lot of time talking about access for um, you know the intertidal community, and the only like the most depressing thing I can say is like that's actually the easiest thing to figure out is access on the intertidal community. Like when you start talking about maintaining docks and wharves and piers, um, it gets really complicated and. Um, Monique went through, um, you know, she's got a great report that she did a couple of years ago, looking at some of the questions and some needs within um, the fishing community. But even when you start, like, there another nonprofit, Dial Institute, wrote this report the last 20 miles about you know, 11 years ago, 12 years ago. But it was like, these are the last 20 miles that we have to work in the waterfront. But when Monique started taking, looking at that data and digging into, like, well, what does that actually mean? What is working water run? How we want to define it? It's like, well, deep water access is extremely different than just a work that might, you know, have a skip next to it, right? And so, types of access really matter. And my my major plea to this community is, you guys have good access. You've got amazing docks and wharves and deep water access in a way that most communities are jealous of. And so, making sure that you preserve to protect it. Holbrooks has done some amazing work down in Cuddy's Harbor. Um, there's a co-op down there as well. The fishermen came together and bought uh, their own their own dock board. But it is um, that's one of those other places that uh, we need to also figure out some tools to how we can invest and um, and not preserve, right? And so I say that purposely because typically what we do with land is we buy it and we say we're protecting this right um and so we in the fishing industry like to grab from like farms and, and ag and land trust right and fishing is constantly evolving and so what we actually need to do is we need to protect and then invest right we need updates we need protections we need safety we need building for that infrastructure for the next generation of what's going to be coming across the docks and whether that is aquaculture, whether that's brown fish coming back, um, whether that is small scale ice machines, like there's a lot of really interesting things that you can do, but we, we run into problems in some communities where a piece of working waterfront infrastructure is protected. And then that limits what you can do to protect the fishing community once it's protected. Um, and so that's, that's a really hard rub that you kind of need to, to build on. But, but Ben, that's why you have to do it on package. You have to understand where is that ideal property and who owns it and when's it going to change hands. Because when it goes on the market, not I mean, we just finished working with a group in Yarmouth that protected a working waterfront marina with the small working fishermen, not recreational boats. And none of the neighbors wanted it there, they wanted houses there. So they raised their money through other means. But still, it cost them four times what it was worth as a business. At Harpswell, Holbrook's, our experience was, cost about four times as much as it was worth as a business. So it's a simple solution. You gotta get somebody to give you three quarters of the money. And then it works. <laughs> but it's true. If you really want to pretend to work in waterfront, somebody has to pay about three quarters of the cost. And he's not gonna be a fisherman. And that's how you do it. That's how they did it in Yarmouth. That's how we did it. Uh, the New Meadows River Co op, the agricultural co op, is trying to acquire a piece of property down Princess Road. And if you drove down there and looked at it, you'd think there were some of your overboard discharge houses that are on that property. They're not you know, fit for human habitation. But that's on the market for a million dollars. Okay? So, and, and they could probably justify three or four or five hundred thousand dollars with a finished product. That's a piece of product, product that, like we had, you got to tear it down and rebuild it. So, before you're done, there's a couple million dollars for that, but it's a great site. And when it's gone, it's gone. And it is coming back. So, I really think you have to start this project by identifying the properties way ahead of time. And having an organized focus on how that property is going to be preserved. Some of which is not currently working large. That's a great point. 
So we've talked a lot about um, the different types of access from parking, market, storage permits, inner title. We didn't even touch on moorings too much. Um, space for gear storage and maintenance. Um, other aspects of infrastructure that we started talking about during COVID that include not necessarily like pieces of property, but things like health insurance and child care, um, cost of living, things like that, grants. Um, and then we talked about you know, the access for non-fishermen to, which is access to the product itself and seafood. Um, I think I'm gonna end with a question for the, the panelists. Um, we're gonna try to, we're gonna end on a happy note. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we like to think about at MCFA is we like to, to uh, reframe challenges and obstacles as opportunities as, you know, something gets difficult. What's the solution that we can identify that can support the fishermen we, with whom we work? So with everything that we've said and talked about tonight, Mary, we can start with you. What's a solution that we can start to, to work on, maybe even sooner rather than later, like a short-term solution um, that maybe everybody can walk away with tonight as an opportunity for access that we can all be thinking about? Well, I think it's something we're just starting to think about more. And it's, it, we're gonna have more and more ideas as we go forward. I was thinking a little bit more about the question that you asked me, uh, about landowners having um, incentives. incentives. Mm -hmm. And yes, when you start thinking about getting uh, land trusts and towns involved in investing into this, uh, an incentive for a landowner might be uh, being some reimbursement for a piece of the property uh, that would be used as an easement. I know Maine Coast Heritage Trust is doing this in some areas. Um, and uh, now I lost the question. But, well, I mean, I think that's, that's a good one, one especially. I think, you know, we were starting. I think and that's the important part. I think we, on an up note, is I, I'm really excited about what I've just learned in the last few weeks about this. And uh, the interest of, you know, like everybody here tonight. I think it's just the beginning, uh, you know, talking about it more and uh, thinking about uh, some unusual ways that we might be able to uh, do this. Robert, do you have any ideas? No, I, I don't know. I just say if you want to give diggers access, just give them a chance. And be honest, like if you want to have your property on the weekends or you don't want us there early in the morning or later in the evening, make sure you tell us that. Um, because I I mean, a lot of places that I have access to, I don't tell other people because I don't want like 10 people running across because I, like I might go to your property five days in a row and then might not go there for another year, but you don't want other diggers there all the time. So you want people to enjoy their property once in a while. So, but I've met some un unbelievable people in Oxford by giving me access. I mean, I've had people bite me in their house, like, giving me cocktails, <laughs> come out in their plant flats and give me hot chocolate while I'm digging in the winter time. So there's some unbelievable people. I mean, I've had people that sold houses and are not so nice to me. But we just be as nice as we can to them, apologize. We'll we have, I have no problem with someone taking over me. Did we give you a cocktail before or after? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Before or after? After, no, I'm saying they fucking go over. Like, they, they're like, oh, come to my house this weekend. We're going to have a get together. You're more than welcome to show up. It's like unbelievable. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people are. Yeah. But a lot of places we don't like to tell other people. Like, too many diggers who really don't want to get bombarded. So that's a hard one. <laughs> what was the question? Uh, well, opportunities, what's a solution or something that we can all kind of take away tonight if there's something everybody can do right away? Like, I don't know, eat more local seafood and make those monk fish too? Is there <laughs> an opportunity or solution <laughs> or something? Yeah, I'll, I'll share uh, two solutions. So one is, um, the best way to protect working waterfront infrastructure is to have money moving across it. 
right? So if we can have good product, people getting paid for it, those businesses are thriving, those properties are protected. Um, so that's that's one piece of it. However, you want to support e more local seafood, that's always the best option. Um, but the second thing is like I I'm a internal optimist, and uh, I think that there's people are good at the end of the day, and um, you're always going to find that that one you know one stick in the mud that's going to be a pain in your ass. But I I tend to think that usually if you can find shared commitment, conversation, um, that you can solve these problems. These are solvable problems. Like there are really big, scary problems out there that are you know, daunting. Like when we talk about access, we can figure that out. We can figure it out by coming together. And whether that's sitting down with somebody and saying, stroke me a check for a million dollars, right? Or it's saying, I need to be able to go across your lawn once a week, is that okay? Um, usually it starts a conversation, it starts a place of sharing goals and um, sharing community. And so I, I think that that's, I'm hopeful because even though like right now what we're seeing is a huge influx of newness into Maine, so many of those people, when you actually meet them, they're coming here because they love it and they don't want to love it to death. They, they need, they want to help, they want to care. We have to give them the tools to care in that appropriate way. And that's that's on us, right? Like if we want to protect this, like it's the hardest thing in my job working with fishermen is convincing fishermen that they are good at talking. Because every time you talk, you're like, oh no, I'm, I'm done. You don't have to say anything, I don't, I'm not good. But then you put them with, with a person, right? Even if that person was a person they might've had conflict with, all they'll do is they'll talk for hours, right? Like, because they, they want to connect. And I, and I really think the more we connect, with these, whether they've been here for generations or they're brand new, building connections, building shared compassion, hope, and goals for that future. I, I don't know. I I think that as as we're seeing this happen, there is there are places that we should definitely be saying this is not just a crisis of change; it is an opportunity to reinvest in ourselves and the next generation. Um, and that's, I've got hope. I, I think. We can, Especially in places like Hope is good. Hope is definitely. And, and Hobson is a great resource. We meet every month. We meet. And if you have any questions about clamming or fishing, please come and let us know because we love to hit them. Like, even if someone dumps garbage, because you know that, you can go pick it up. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we have public comment at the beginning. And at the end, so we'd love to hear any. Issues. I mean, please come. It's right on the optional website calendar. What day? <laughs> so, on that note, too, um, we also have another working waterfront panel in June on the fifteenth, June fifteenth. That one's going to be about etiquette on the water. We chose that topic because. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but it's pretty busy in Harpswell in the summertime, especially in the past few years, and the traffic on the water is increasing as well. Um, so we're going to have, I uh, believe there'll be a fisherman, a charter boat captain, someone from MCFA, um, to just talk about how we all use space on the water. Oh, we can Main Island Trails. Main Island Trails Association is going to join for that one as well. Um, just to talk about how where you can all be students uh, of the ocean and good users and, you know, learn a little bit from each other. I would say, I'll, you know, my answer to my own question would be like that communication piece and connection. I think it's just such a good place to start with some of this. So on that note too, make sure to check out the Harpswell Anchors. Susan's been writing some articles that kind of go along with our panel series that explore some of these topics. Um, so we are trying to share more information, real estate, people can always even give um, MCFA's email addresses. We're happy to talk to people about commercial fishing <laughs> or any of their questions. Um, and then tell your friends about our, our panel series is too. Um, this is awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us on such a beautiful evening. And I, I hope you try some more main coast one fish stew on your way out. Um, and thanks again for joining. Thank you.